my name is Shane. For those who are new, welcome back if you're returning. My last video, we were talking about the plea agreement that Micah's family and JP Miller had come to. I wondered if this was going to be the end of our investigation, but it looks like the investigation with the FBI will continue, and we'll just have to wait to see what comes out in the future. For now, I do have the interview with Regina Ward. We did take a look at a few of the clips in my last video, but today I just wanted to sit back and sort of watch and react to what she had to say and what is going to become of Micah's estate, her charity, and all of that moving forward. So this week our news team traveled to South Carolina's Grand Strand where a surprise development in the case of Micah Miller unfolded. A settlement between Miller's family and John Paul Miller and the Solid Rock Church where he is the pastor. Now, now this settlement is a global agreement encompassing all actions and all parties to this case so it is a significant development not one without controversy however but before the settlement was reached literally just hours before our media outlet sat down to conduct an interview with the lead attorney for the francis family micah miller's family regina ward here in its entirety is that conversation all right here we go so this is again regina ward she is the one who has been covering micah's side of the divorce case and all that fun stuff so uh here she is to speak now with us today i know it's a big day in fact there's a hearing on this case today as we're taping this we're preparing you're preparing for this hearing uh in Ori county probate court i wanted to ask you before we get into the details of this massive case, which we can see here, the work your office is putting into it. I wanted to ask you, you were representing Micah. You were talking to Micah in the days, in the weeks leading up to what happened back in April. Can you tell us anything about those interactions, about her state of mind, her frame of mind? Everything we've been shown indicates a woman who was looking forward, who was excited about this new life that she was embarking on. Can you tell us just anything about her demeanor during those days? Before Regina speaks, that's kind of what we talked about. It was so odd to see a woman uh, retain a lawyer for a divorce, file for divorce, um, get baptized, get baptized shortly before she unalived herself. Like she did all these steps. Uh, the, the charity work that she was excited for, the school she wanted to start in Africa. I mean, everything, in my opinion, was pointing to a woman who is looking forward to a life beyond this relationship. So before Regina even started to say anything, I just want to say that even, even as an outsider looking in, I was able to take notice of that as well. W what we are concluding happened to Micah doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Oh, yes, absolutely. And what you just said is exactly uh, the impression that I got. In fact, um, she sat pretty much in that chair you're sitting right now um, in one of our interactions and talking about it. And she was so happy um, that she shared with me that she felt that she'd finally found what uh, God's calling was for her life, uh, which was basically the missions, um, the mm. children in Africa, um, and education for children who are deprived of an appropriate education. She was- I mean, did anything ever like devastating happen with the ministry? Did it fall through or something that would like tip Micah over the edge? Because if you're <sighs> not necessarily like a reason for living, but I guess almost at the same time, like this, school seemed uh, 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 to take up a lot of Micah's attention in, in a positive way. I don't think anything has been said about it falling through. I don't know if it's Anna or Anna, Micah's sister, but she sat down with Regina as well and talked about uh, the charity and stuff and how she said that her and her family wanted to take that over for Micah. So I can't imagine something fell through. Let me just say ecstatic. And um, it, was, um, it was uplifting uh, to hear her talk about it and to see her so happy about it and she most assuredly was of you know there was no indication of anything um you know remotely close to um a severe depression or anything like that of course anyone that goes through a divorce or a separation or an ending of a 
uh, marriage, there is always, um, you know, what we call situational depression. In other words, this situation is making me sadder than most. Uh, but she uh, was taking uh, responsibility of making sure that she was addressing that with the appropriate uh, therapist and um, and her medical. I'm not saying it goes for everybody, uh, but typically, you know, when you're in therapy, you're looking for steps forward to work through emotions, problems. Uh, I'm not saying because... Lots of people have unfortunately unalived themselves. It's another step pointing in that direction of my theory that Micah was trying to take steps in order to have a brighter future, a better future. And one other side note as well, nothing to do with the interview, but why did Micah never leave um, a suicide note behind? If she was that worried about her family finding her deceased, I don't know, there was like nothing left behind with her family. Called the 911 dispatcher, so she was making phone calls. Why didn't she call anybody else? Because, I mean, at that point, you're already at the place where you're going to do it, right? They're not going to have much time to react. Um, I, was, I was so happy for her because she had finally reached a place where she was done and she was ready to move on and she just didn't want to fight anymore. Hmm. You talked about that... that plan that she had for her life, the, the mission work, how central to Micah Miller was faith. It was the core and the soul of her. Whenever you met Micah, um, you just felt like you were pulled in to the joy that the spiritual word, the word of God, and the teachings of Jesus were principles that she was drawn to, that she was um, wanting to to really abide by in, in every way possible. Um, and then, you know, which kind of reminds me of, a, you know, what I thought about at one point after her death was that um, I know that she was really, really, really struggling with this, um, I guess, sort of a, a contradiction, but not really, in the word of the Bible. And she actually made some videos touching on this. And one thing was, you know, God hates divorce. God hates divorce. So what that means is when you're in a marriage is you're supposed to do the work to try to prevent that. Um, she also talked about, you know, forgiveness and praying for our enemies. And when someone does something wrong, uh, you know, um, is not honest in their dealings with you or they've said or done something that may hurt you, that you're supposed to be Jesus-like and, and forgive that person. And not only forgive that person, you're to pray for them. So now you have. Could it also be the possibility that Micah felt an immense amount of guilt from her uh, first marriage ending in an affair? So she felt like she had to try maybe extra hard in this next relationship to really make it work because God was already mad at her for being unfaithful the first time. Because it feels like, just like Regina was saying, and I'm glad that she's point uh, touching on this because if she didn't, I was going to bring up. Micah's videos where she even talked about herself, um, you know, God hates divorce, God hates divorce in the Bible, but God also doesn't like abuse. At what point do you, I guess, just not take anymore and not accept anymore? Or when does it become okay uh, to get a divorce? I feel like that's something that Micah struggled on exponentially. Uh, and then the other principle is the principle of being... Oh, oh, and I also forget to mention, if you haven't caught up as well, the reason that JP wasn't leaving her, you have to imagine he's the pastor of the church. How bad is it going to look if he divorces his wife, if it wasn't for like another affair or something, if they just weren't working out? JP even alluded, I believe, to a sermon that Sierra brought up where he was talking about the wife having to leave the husband rather than the husband leaving her. So I don't believe that JP was budging so Micah was really stuck in a spot where she was unhappy and maybe felt like that she wasn't being treated right but also was struggling with trying to be a, a good Christian in her terms. An obedient spouse as a wife, um, you know, and the, 
the religious teachings that she followed is that the man is the head of the household um, and the wife uh, should be subservient to him. But there's a flip side of that. In order for the man to gain his wife, uh, you know, being subservient or to following his lead in God is that um, the Bible also says that you treat your wife as the bride of Christ and you're supposed to protect her and do, you know, all that you can to make sure that she flourishes and is nourished, uh, nurtured. Um, so she had this difficulty in reconciling. I have a duty as a spouse to follow the lead of my husband and um, to do the things that he asked me to do, and she did, even the terrible things. She was also zealously protective of, of the church, of, of the Christian faith. She Absolutely. Didn't, she didn't want what was transpiring in her life to turn people off to faith, to attending church. and uh, Obviously, them speak, but they're making a really good point that I didn't think of, that Micah maybe felt like she had an obligation as the pastor's wife to be the, to be the face of it. So it's not going to look very good again if she files for divorce. Uh, so I feel like she had a lot of pressure on her. In fact, you Correct. Can even argue that she perhaps endured some of this that perhaps no one else would have because she didn't want people to be turned off or steered away from faith. You think that was... Uh, that absolutely was important to her. Um, she would make the comment or statement um, that uh, church is not a person, the church is not the man, the church is not the pastor, the church is the people. Um, she absolutely loved that church. Um, she did everything that she could to try to protect the church. She didn't want the church or the congregation, the members, to um, take this sort of situation and um, lose their faith. It was incredibly important to her um, that that not interfere. And I think she did a video where she talked about she apologized for having to keep her circle kind of small, you know, at this time. Um, and that was for a number of reasons. Uh, but at the same time, it was like, you know, please continue to believe in God and have your faith and say your prayers and, you know, continue to live and abide by the teachings of our Bible. It's amazing to see. Um, there's a saying, uh, people that don't read the Bible read people that read the Bible. Um, basically saying that um, I think... Again, speculation. I believe Micah felt a sense of pressure to be a role model. Uh, she loved her community, as they're speaking of as well. Be able to do that when they are the subject of this relentless manipulation and mischaracterization, kind of like a inside the church smear campaign being waged against her. Yes. Yet she continued to do her best not to cause believers to stumble. Basically. Correct. Um, she was I would I would say she was self sacrificial. Um, that she was willing to sacrifice herself uh, in order to preserve um, and protect um, the followers of the word that they would not get distracted by the fallible man that may be associated with it. Um, that 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 is not what brings you to church. What brings you to church are the teachings of God and and what Jesus, the, what he represented in this world. And so that was critically important to her to protect that. And I think to some degree, maybe to her own detriment in that she endured things for a longer period of time, hoping and praying just like the teachings were, you know, be an obedient wife. That means don't go against your husband, uh, you know, be a good Christian and that you forgive your enemies. Um, someone's doing bad, terrible things to you, you're still supposed to forgive them and pray for them. Um, you know, and at the end when she finally reconciled, I feel like uh, that, you know, God does not want you to stay in marriage just because he hates divorce. God hates abuse. God hates abuse. And just like she said, what do you think that God thinks about that? What do you think he would do about that? In other words, she was laying you know, what was happening to her, she did not want to be vindictive and lash out and, you know, smear him. She would not allow me as the attorney. What I wanted to do was put a lot of this in the pleadings, you know, and um, she did not 
give me permission to do that. She said, I don't want that to happen. I just want to be separated. I just want this to stop. I just want to move on with my life. And at the end of a year, I'll get the divorce. And, um, and of course, you know, she, it didn't quite work out that way. Uh, and, and I wish that she would have let me put some of those things in there. But at the end of the day, what it was is she wanted to still protect her husband. Okay. She still, she definitely wanted to protect the church, uh, the name of the church, the congregation and everything. And she didn't want to use it. She had everything she could have used in that situation and chose not to. She said that God doesn't want me to be vindictive. God doesn't want me to lash out. And at the end of the day, what she was referring to is God is the one who will judge and God is the one who will punish. She's got that right. Let me ask you. Again, with Micah's faith, I believe she felt that if she was uh, continued to be a good wife, continued to be a faithful wife, that God could see all of the uh, abuse that was done to her. And basically, uh, it would be taken care of for her. She didn't necessarily need to fight the fight. The problem is, if you remain in a, in a miserable situation, most people get to a point of where you just can't take it anymore. And I truly think he started getting to her and really started to scare her. The threatening of showing up to her sister's apartment where she was staying in the 911 phone call we covered from that. The tracking devices, the private investigators. Um, she probably she probably felt like she couldn't even trust the entire community that she was going to church with and that was clearly important to Micah. She talked about that way forward, that future for her that she was embracing. Um, you said that she'd reconciled herself. Yes. We've all seen that ring camera footage um, from the day that she died. Yes. And I've watched it probably a dozen times and I see so a, a woman on her way to work um, leaving at the time that she would leave to go to work. Um, yes. You know, starting to get into that new routine of this, this new chapter of her life. Obviously something happened after she walked away out of the view of that camera. That's interesting that she left at the time that she would normally leave if she was heading right to work, but then we see her go right to Dick's. I'm wondering if there was a phone call or some sort of communication between last seeing her on her ring camera at her apartment to her uh, getting in her car and heading off to work. Because even during her first stop, we see her take off, I believe she had like a collared shirt on and then when she showed up to the pawn shop she didn't. Why would you bother even putting your work shirt on if you're not planning on going to work? You know, it just... Th this, this is why I was frustrated when I thought that the case would be like over and done with. Something happened between then and the 911 call that was placed Correct. at the Lumber River Park up in North Carolina. Let me ask you this question. What do you think happened that day? Well, of course, anything that I would think is speculation and that is the million dollar question um, I personally believe that that answer to that or some form of answer to that will be on that cell phone or that Apple watch that is in the possession of I just realized my bunnies legal authorities um, and so we have a court order requiring those things to be released to my office and they won't release it until they have finished their quote investigation um, all legal authorities. And so um, I'm hoping that when I get my hands on those things that that may hold the answer. But I also... I'm so sorry, you know, I got distracted by the bunny. I personally believe that that answer to that or some form of answer to that will be on that cell phone or that Apple Watch that is in the possession of the legal authorities. Thank you, by the way, for those who answered the question. This was a clip we reacted to in my last video, and I missed something because I didn't know anybody had possession of an Apple Watch, and you guys clarified that it's Micah's Apple Watch, so thank you for that. But that's what she's talking about in case you don't know. Um, and so we have a court order requiring those things to be released to my office, and they won't release it until they have finished their, quote, investigation. Um, all legal authorities. And so um, I'm hoping that it's going to go through all legal authorities before it gets to m the victim's lawyer. What? 
I get my hands on those things that, that may hold the answer. But I also, you know, from a theoretic sort of a, you know, uh, stance is that Mr. Miller um, was very um, consistent in his, you know, contact with her. He's even made, co uh, you know, comments in other news agencies and so forth that he's, I don't know, he sent her six or seven emails. I uh, haven't got my hands on those yet. Um, he made comments that he sent emails to her on the same day that she died and then realized that there were two that she probably didn't get. Um, there are a couple of things that don't add up. There are two specific things that he said um, that were so contradictory and there's outside evidence to prove. I wondered if somebody could get their hands on the, vic uh, on the emails that he claimed to have sent when he sat down with Rich McHugh in News Nation. He said, I sent her six or seven emails or whatever, and I wondered if somebody could do a, um, could get a warrant to search for those emails. So Regina's just saying she hasn't even seen those right now. So again, how do you close this investigation when half of the evidence has it? And to um, sustain um, what I'm thinking about particularly, uh, but I would say that I would not be surprised if he made some form of contact with her, because you have to remember that I well, served. The day she died. Yes, uh, on you have to remember that I served him the separation papers on that day. So um, he had made a comment um, to me specifically that, gosh, something must be really wrong because Regina Ward has been hired on the case, and we know nobody gets Regina Ward unless it's a big case. And I was like. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm sorry. You know. I'm going to have to rewatch this in editing, but did he? I might have to rewatch it now. What did she just say? That I would not be surprised if he made some form of contact with her because you have to remember that I well, served. The day she died. Yes. Uh, the legal authorities. <gasps> um, and so we have a court order requiring those things to be released to my office. And they won't release it until they have finished their, quote, investigation. Mr. Miller um, was very um, consistent in his, you know, contact with her. He's even made, co uh, you know, comments in other news agencies and so forth that he's, I don't know, he sent her six or seven emails. I haven't got my hands on those yet. Um, he made comments that he sent emails to her on the same day that she died and then realized that there were two that she probably didn't get. Um, there are a couple of things that don't add up. There are two specific things that he said um, that were so contradictory and there's outside evidence to prove it. You have to remember that I served him the separation papers on that day. So um, he had made a comment um, to me specifically that, gosh, something must be really wrong because Regina Ward has been hired on the case. And we know nobody gets Regina Ward unless it's a big case. And I was like, okay, well, <laughs> you know, we're, we're not making a big deal out of it. We're just pursuing a separation. So um, I would not be surprised if he did not start at that moment, the second that he got um, served, um, to start berating her with either phone calls or leaving her messages or texting her. You know, basically, he weaponized the Bible against her, and I would not be surprised if that happened. Ignore these, by the way. I apologize. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about, you mentioned that weaponization of the, of the scripture, you know, isolating her from family, from friends, um, the tactics of, of, of this man and, and the totality of this abuse, yeah. uh, harassment, stalking, uh, and it wasn't just Micah, was it? There are others who have fallen victim to John Paul Miller, aren't there? Um, it appears to be. Um, there's definitely a pattern that seems to have emerged here. Uh, whenever you put everything together, it is a consistent pattern that's not only consistent to what Mr. Miller himself has done, uh, but I've been practicing law for almost 20 years, and about, even though I'm a general practitioner doing, 
you know, family court criminal and personal injury, uh, probably more than 50% of my clients um, are in the domestic arena. And of that 50% of those clients, I would say probably nearly 50% of those are always coming in complaining about, um, you know, narcissistic tendencies of their spouse, uh, controlling uh, tendencies of their spouse. They all seem to have the same types of complaints you know he took my credit cards he cut up my credit cards he turned off my phone he took my phone um, he changed the password on my computer um, all of these things to just keep backing and boxing a person in um, and it's it's very prevalent and it's been overlooked for far too long and we're going to talk about some of this as we get into the course of control angle of, of this and the potential for legislation yes. here in South Carolina that could enhance the current domestic violence statutes. But before, before we get into that, I wanted to ask you this about the current state of play as it relates to the civil cases that are currently pending, custody, uh, probate, but also the potential for additional civil actions, whether from the Francis family, from potential other victims, Walk us through sort of the overview of the, the lay of the land civilly. Sure. Um, I do need to straighten out something with the family court case. Um, while Mr. Miller mentioned that they would go pick up the children every single day, um, they did not have children together. Those were children from his prior marriage. Um, I would be surprised they would have them every day. Usually there's a, you know, a custody schedule. Oh, but in, I, I didn't catch that. Good catch, though. I mean, she, she is a lawyer. A, um, the family court matter um, is pending uh, to address a division of the marital estate, and um, so there are no custody custody issues. It's also not a divorce in the state of South Carolina. You can't get a divorce unless you have grounds. Micah certainly had grounds. She had grounds for physical cruelty. She had grounds for adultery, um, and she chose not to go that route. So it's a family court proceeding. The reason that it's pending now is is simply to divide the marital estate and get that part, um, you know, that was hers. Wait, uh, wait, 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 wait. So she she's saying you can't get a divorce unless, like, something like that happens? You can't just say... We have a conflict of differences. Wow. The other action that is pending, of course, is the probate case. And the probate case, of course, is going to deal with her estate. And generally, if a person dies with the will, then her estate would have been uh, distributed pursuant to her wishes in the will. So there was no will. And because of that, it's going to be divided pursuant to the statutory um, provisions, which usually says... If you're married, goes to your spouse, and if you're married and have children, it's divided between the two, etc. Um, so basically, the point of that is that he's trying to become the personal representative of the estate, while Sierra is serving as what we call the special administrator of the estate. And so her duties are to collect, um, you know, the property that may belong to the estate to pursue particular litigation at that time. It was specifically for the marital litigation so that we could keep that going and it, you know, not um, be dismissed. Um, as far as any other actions, um, you know, uh, I've been retained for the civil action. The civil action could uh, include multiple types of things uh, or actions in my opinion. You know, um, there may be some folks that would disagree with me, but I think that there's a potential uh, wrongful death case. You know, there's not really much on point for that, so I think that it's um, maybe a novel issue that I'm certainly willing to take up in this case. I can't think of a better fact pattern than this one. I was about to say, if there's a case that's going to test that theory, this would be it. It would be it. Also, the other thing that I feel like... Um, is a very strong case. Um, it's called intentional infliction of emotional distress. That is a legal cause of action, a tort claim, that exists on the books in the state of South Carolina. And there is uh, indisputably enough evidence to support that. Intentional infliction of emotional distress is a tort that occurs when one acts in a manner that intentionally or recklessly causes another to suffer severe emotional distress, such as issuing the threat of future harm.
It's a legal cause of action, a tort claim, that exists on the books in the state of South Carolina. And there is uh, indisputably enough evidence to support that um, as well. We also think of assault and we also think of battery. Okay, Most people think of those terms in criminal terms, but it also exists in the civil world. Um, so we can sue for assault, um, that is, you know, placing a, a, a point of fear into someone. Um, there's also a, a battery, civil battery, and that is an unwanted touch, which we have evidence of that too. So those are some of the civil actions that could be um, proposed. The other thing is I um, believe that Micah was underpaid uh, by the church. Um, so she, she certainly was not a volunteer because she was paid. Um, she had seven or eight positions um, that were all sorely underpaid. If you extrapolated one of those positions, for instance, I think it was the media director, the range of uh, salary is somewhere between fifty and eighty thousand dollars a year. So I think that there may be a claim against the church for underpayment of wages. We're going to do a part two because we have about 20 more minutes of the interview. So what on earth have they agreed on in trial then? Because it seems like a wrongful death suit might still be coming. I will keep reacting to any more information that comes out regarding this and future cases, as well as part two to this interview because I want to keep hearing what Regina has to say. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed today's video and I'll see you in my next one.